everyone. Welcome to the Biomedical Engineering Technology Info Session. Um, it is being presented today by Anthony Chan and Jesse Taylor. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to say that the British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam. Now, our agenda for today. I'm going to start by doing some welcome and introductions. We're going to go into a video, a presentation, and a program overview, a message from program advising, and some time for questions and answers. Now, I'd like to just introduce, uh, first of all, Jennifer Elliott, our Associate Dean. She'll just give a wave. Um, Anthony Chan, our Program Head. Alex Sayer, our Instructor. Jesse Taylor, our Program Advisor. And myself, I'm Julie. Uh, we also have Janice Pontes, who's another advisor that she'll be on the chat and able to answer some of your really more specific questions. And now I hand it over to Anthony. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, so welcome to the Biomedical Engineering Technology Information Session. So the question is, what is the primary role of a Biomedical Engineering Technologist working in a hospital? So there are three answers repair medical equipment, evaluate new medical equipment, and ensure medical equipment is safe and effective. So feel free to answer this question. Okay, so most of you said ensure medical equipment is safe and effective. Um, actually, everyone is right. Actually, all these are responsibility of a biomedical engineering technologist working in the hospital. Um, so um, hopefully you'll get a better idea of what is the what is biomedical engineering and what's the role of our grads working in the industry after this presentation. Okay, thank you. So let's go on. Julie. Okay, so first I'd like you to look at our video. Today we're here at VGH and we will be testing out the hyperbaric chamber and checking the ventilator that's within the hyperbaric chamber and making sure that the um, oxygen levels as well as the CO2 levels are normal. So as a biomedical engineering technologist, you're involved in the life cycle of medical devices. So that involves the acquisition and procurement of new devices, as well as new device testing and making sure they're all ready to go. I love my job because every day is different. Um, medical device technology is ever always changing and evolving. It's really exciting to be able to work with so many different types of technology. Being able to work on devices like this is really interesting. So the biomedical engineering program at BCIT is a two-year diploma program and we teach them all the basics that they need to know to be able to look after medical devices. What we do is we teach them the basic building blocks that all medical devices are made from. Once they have an understanding of the building blocks, then they can figure out any device that they've never seen before. They can handle anything. Uh, my name is Emily Lankhorst. Uh, I'm a graduate of the Biomedical Engineering Program at BCIT. I work as a post-market quality engineer at Stryker. You know, I'd had a previous experience in university, you know, I did an arts degree, and I guess I just felt like I wasn't really set up to find a job after that. Um, but coming to BCIT, just, you know, the, the work placements, the industry connections, the hands-on lab experience, um, yeah, I just really felt like BCIT offered the technical skills that I needed to, you know, be able to work right away. Thanks to BCIT, I have a really rewarding career that's just full of possibilities and opportunities for the future to grow, develop, keep learning, and uh, keep working in a really cool, you know, field of healthcare. So, um, well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, it shows some of our grads as well as uh, people working in the industry. So what is biomedical engineering technology? Um, it's, the field is very broad, um, but what it is is biomedical engineering applies science and engineering to healthcare and 
medical device industry. Um, our curriculum at BCIT uh, is focused in medical device technology. Right? If you go to, for example, UBC or some other places, they may be focused on, say, materials or, or some other areas of biomedical engineering. But remember, our program is focused on medical device technology. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Julie. Um, so let's go through what is in our program. Um, just a little bit of history of our program. Next slide. Our first graduating class is in 1969. Um, so 1969 is not a typo. Our program has been around for over 50 years. Uh, we graduated a lot of uh, uh, biomedical engineering technologists. If you step in the hospital today, uh, over, I would say, 95% of biomedical engineering technologists graduate from our hospital, um, as well as many graduate work in the medical device industry, in research labs, and in medical equipment companies. Our program is nationally accredited. So what it means is, um, our program meet the education requirement uh, to for our graduates to be registered as a biomedical engineering technologist, <clears throat> which is important uh, because um, some of our grad go across uh, the country, for example, to Ontario or even um, um, uh, Quebec, and they their education got recognized, as well as the national accreditation in Canada has some agreement with some. Um, uh, countries like New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, etc. So they can be their education can will be recognized. Um, also, about twenty percent of our students uh, came into our program straight from the high school, um, and then about forty percent are female. Um, biomedical engineering is an engineering profession that is very suitable for, for female students because they don't need to get into uh, uh, a mine, they don't need to be um, working, uh, uh, lifting very heavy equipment, etc. So, so it's a field that is suitable for both male and female uh, uh, students. And our student has been winning awards in engineering design competitions. So we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later. And over 90% of engineering uh, technologists work in BC hospitals are graduated from our program, which I already mentioned earlier. Next one, Julie. Um, you see a few slides about our student working in our labs. Um, at BCIT, we have a very comprehensive school of health sciences, which has many allied health programs, including medical radiography, nuclear medicine, cardiology, sonography, etc. So why is it important for our program to be within the School of Health Sciences is we can use the lab facilities and the equipment for our training, which some of them are very expensive, and we have the opportunity to be able to uh, have our students working in those areas. Next slide. So these are some of the equipment in, in our labs. I don't know whether you recognize that, but um, these are defibrators, which you uh, often seen in on TV or movie that someone have an heart attack and the paramedic will jump and try to um, uh, defibrate the heart. Those are, these are those equipment. So in our program, we teach students the principal operation on this device technology. For example, uh, how can this device um, sort of uh, reverse the heart condition from fibrillation to a normal heart rhythm? Um, and also then look into what are the uh, technology to say deliver these voltages or current to the patient, look at the component construction of the devices, as well as to learn how to carry out performance assurance on these devices, make sure that the, these devices are working properly in the field. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned earlier, um, 
our student some uh, won quite a lot of uh, awards in student design, engineering design competitions. Um, so this is, these are projects designed, developed by and built by our student uh, during the last term in the second year. Um, so uh, these are a few projects that I'm showing here and also the uh, competition uh, and, and prize that they won in, in, in the particular year. And if you notice on the um, le lower left hand side, there's there are a pair of eyes. Um, actually, we have um, a faculty here today that was our student. Very, very familiar uh, eyes, yeah. yes. So Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about the design competition and what, what is it about? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so at the bottom left there, so I was a graduate of the program in uh, 2012. Um, and so our project that uh, my my two uh, uh, students or my two peers and I made was an eye tracking unit. And I, I, I want to start off by saying like at the beginning of the project, I didn't know the first thing about uh, tracking or anything about eye tracking. Uh, we started doing some research in December before the project course began in January. Uh, we sent off an email to a manufacturer in, in Washington uh, who made the sensor that you see photographed right next to my eye there. Uh, he didn't respond uh, and we actually waited a, a while and we looked into different avenues. Uh, but then when he, uh, we emailed him again about mid-January uh, and he responded very kindly. Um, so he actually provided us with uh, five sensors each that he priced around 50 bucks. Uh, he sent those to us for free to play around with, as well as the source code. Uh, and it really showed me that like, if you start a project uh, and it seems insurmountable, uh, as long as you take it one step at a time, you can, you can really do amazing things. Uh, I was lucky in my group that everyone had a different special specialty. Uh, and I ended up learning a lot more about coding from the project course, uh, just working with, with my, uh, my partners. Uh, and as, as well as like we again we each had our own specialty uh, learning about actually how to build and, and assemble a medical device so um so alex talked about his device but a student came into our program first usually the first and second term they learn about the different uh the fundamentals right the basic uh, understanding of medical devices learn about the electronics software programming and eventually getting into the first term, they will learn about how to, not just how to build a medical device, but what are the steps uh, to build a medical device, how they can build a medical device so that they can get uh, to the regulatory approval uh, to, for those devices to be marketed and used on patients. So uh, Alex learned all these before he got into the final year project course. And then he, conceptualize the device and build the device. And then he put it out for uh, enter into an engineering design competition. And what, what, what prize did you win, Alex? A principal award winner. Okay, and you got some money as well, right? Yeah, we, we ended up splitting uh, $5,000 at the time. Okay, so uh, that was in 2012 when Alex was still a student in, in our program, but now he is, he is teaching in our program as well. Um, but the other two, uh, uh, project that you have seen are some other projects from from other students at different years. For example, the one with the arm is actually a, a, what we call smart cast. Uh, the idea was initiated by a physiotherapist that who uh, sort of um, find out that it's difficult to assess what this uh, if someone broke their arm. It's, for example, uh, once they have the cast on, it's diff very difficult to assess. What, how, how well the, uh, the bone has healed and what is underneath the calf. So uh, they, they approach our program and then uh, we assign two students working with this physiotherapist. Um, so this cast was 3D printed and then there was some sensor underneath the cast and then the signal was uh, captured, right? Temperature, the alignment of the bone was captured and then the signal is sent through um, uh, Bluetooth to a cell phone. So um, the physiotherapist can read from the cell phone to understand what, what is the healing process of the patient. So that's, that's an example of, of uh, a couple of examples of the project that our student built. Next slide, please, Julie. 
So the program, um, a BCIT, Biomedical Engineering Technology, is a two-year full-time program. So after you finish the program, you get a diploma of te uh, biomedical uh, technology and biomedical engineering. Um, the program has uh, every year has two 15 weeks academic terms. So both first and second year has two 15 weeks academic term. Um, January to April is one term, September to December is uh, two term. But also over and above the academic term, we have what we call the uh, practice term. So first year um, after the final exam, all students will get into a five weeks uh, workshop term, which they will learn about, for example, some mechanical skills, like using hand tools, using some simple uh, machineries like drills, etc. And also they learn how to do 3D printing, right? Uh, how to use adhesive or the, the different principle and practice of uh, soldering, um, circuit simulation, et cetera, et cetera. So these are five weeks of very fun uh, skill development term in year one. Um, second year, still have two academic term, but, um, but in this final term, um, student all will need to do a capstone project which was the one that uh, Alex mentioned, right? The capstone project that students will have to build uh, from conceptualization, design and build and test a medical device. Then after that, um, all the students will need to go to the industry to do five weeks of what we call industry practicum. And that's a mandatory part of the curriculum. So they go to say work in the hospital or work in medical device company. Uh, most often they will be treated as an entry level biomedical engineering technologist. So the idea is to uh, get them to get the taste of real working environment and also to apply what they have learned in the two years in some real uh, uh, working situation. Next please, Julie. Um, Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience in practicum? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So I took a keen uh, liking to the medical imaging class, uh, learning about x-rays, ultrasounds, MRIs, and uh, nuclear imaging uh, techniques. Uh, so because of this, I decided to take, uh, to, uh, take my practicum in a hospital's uh, radiology service department. So I was actually placed at Royal Columbian Hospital and I got to travel again. I, I was placed there uh, compared to uh, uh, VGH or that because or or VHA uh, just because it was closer to my my house. So there's a little bit of a uh, 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 effort that's put in there. So if if you're if you're placed into a hospital, uh, but I got to travel all around Fraser Health with the service techs, uh, and we got I got to complete preventative maintenance in X-ray rooms. I was able to watch a live angiogram in the cardiac cath lab. Uh, I walked around the MRI department daily, checking the pressure on the helium condensers, which actually uh, cooled the superconductors. Uh, and then I was in and out of the OR, looking at C-arms and, and portable X-ray equipment. Uh, and as a working biomed, I always look forward to June because when we have practicum students, uh, I always enjoyed looking at it uh, through their, their fresh eyes, uh, seeing all the amazing technology uh, that they've learned about being used in, actually in the real world. Okay, next slide, please. So these are some example of practicum sites that uh, we have lined up with the local and also uh, national uh, company or hospitals. So you can take a quick look. There are some medical device company doing R&D and manufacturing development of new medical devices. Uh, many hospitals all across the country uh, you can see family name like GE Phillips, who are uh, medical equipment providers uh, uh, to the local hospitals. So all of these are practicum sites that we, uh, like students, if they are interested in some area of the particular site, we are able to uh, align them to do the practicum in these locations. Next slide, please. So I guess most of you, when you are looking 
and programs at BCIT, what comes in your mind is, well, what type of jobs can I get after graduation, right? Um, so graduate from our by my program at BCIT, um, you can work in a, a, a different of areas. Uh, the first one is what we call the service and support area. For example, working in the hospital, uh, supporting these medical devices, like the answers that you, the poll that you, you answer uh, at the beginning, right? Those are service and support. As well, um, some of our grad may be hired by uh, GE or Phillips to be field service uh, specialist, which they will go to the hospital to do installation, do performance inspection, repair, etc. The second area is um, research and development. Um, for example, companies like, like Stryker, Curus, uh, they manufacture, they do research and development uh, on medical devices. For example, uh, Keras, um, they actually expanded quite rapidly um, because of the pandemic, which because they uh, they design and produce these handheld ultrasound devices, which are in very hot and high demand uh, internationally. So we have a practical arrangement with Curus, and we have grads working at the, at the company as well, doing uh, research, development, testing of medical devices. Um, also in device manufacturing, there are some medical device manufacturing uh, company uh, in, in BC, Right? For example, Daytran, uh, Stryker, they manufacture their own medical device here. Um, so our grads can work in those areas. But these people, uh, our grads, when they work in medical manufacturing companies, they are not the, usually the ones that are doing all the assemblies. So uh, not like what you saw in TV, they're sitting on the production line, right, parking component on the device, but rather they are working usually in the position of quality assurance people. They look at the production line, they may Im uh, improve or revise or design some manufacturing procedures, uh, do quality testing, etc. cetera. Um, next area is sales and marketing, which sometimes um, is not too common for uh, fresh graduate to work in this area. Usually, People work in the industry for a number of years. If they are interested in uh, doing sales and marketing, they, they may get into this area. Again, these are not just like used car salesmen or whatever. They are specialized technical sales and marketing people. So usually when they go to uh, do a marketing um, uh, event, like usually it's a team of sales and the with technical people and they go and they were able to explain all the technical terms and do demonstrations to, to the uh, potential clients. Um, the last thing is further studies. Um, when you, well, depend on what your, what is your academic background, right? You come to our program, you finish, you get a diploma. So uh, you can, uh, be hired and call yourself biomedical engineering technologist. Um, but oftentimes our grads after, well, maybe right after graduation or they have worked for a few years and they want to get further credentials. So they may get into some further studies. Julie, next slide, please. So what do you mean by further studies? For example, um, you are engineering technologists when you finish our program. But if you want to become an engineer, so if you are really interested, I can tell you, you can go right into right nowadays, SFU, UBC, they are biomedical engineering program that graduate engineers. So four or five years uh, degree program, uh, but they are not, the same as graduate from our program. We are technology focused, whereas they are more in terms of research or, or first level principle focus. Um, so some of our grad want to get an engineering degree. Um, and we have some laddering pathway for our grads and many of our grad actually chose and, and uh, end up getting an engineering degree. Um, 
So in terms of going uh, continuing BCIT or go to SFU or some other universities. Also, there are some grads that may want to be a supervisor, manager, project leaders, etc. Uh, in the two in our two year program, we you may notice that there's no management training, there's no finance um, uh, management or accounting or whatever those are trainings, uh, which sometimes is important for a supervisor or manager in a technology oriented companies. So within BCIT, we have a bachelor degree in technology management, which our pro, uh, grad can get right into, and they, they will learn management principles and management know-hows. And this degree at BCIT can be led into the S. Simon Fraser University MBA degree in uh, uh, management of technology. So they will be saving time because they get credits in getting into those programs. Next slide, please. Um, so this um, is sort of the result of survey that BCIT for every program, they, they conduct survey on their graduate. This is some, uh, uh, some of the outcome of the survey, which is posted online. If you are interested, you can go to the B, our, our program page, go to em, employment, and then there's a link that you can look at the most recent survey. I guess, um, next slide please, Julie. So there's a testimonial. Alex, do you want to read out the testimonial to the? I'd love to. So this is a uh, testimonial from a uh, recent grad from in uh, 2018, uh, uh, Spirit Grinke. Uh, two years ago, I graduated from the BCIT BMET program and I can truly say that it helped me helped shape me myself into the person I am today. Uh, during the BMET program, I was faced with many challenges, each one geared in a specific way to help you grow onto the next. I can confidently say that after overcoming the challenges during the program, I felt like I was well prepared to start my professional career. My job as a service technician at Patterson Dental is to repair dental equipment and to support customers. I repair anything from x-rays to small machines to circuit boards, all while maintaining professionalism and ensuring high quality service. Each day I am faced with challenges physically and mentally, but I have never doubted myself that I cannot find a solution. A complex problem is easy once you know how to find the answer. All this, uh, all this taught you to, all this is taught to you throughout the program and has been uh, embroidered into my traits. Okay, so with that, then I will pass on to our um, uh, program of rising and admission to talk about admission. Julie, next slide. I'll just quickly finish my comment. Um, within the program advising department, we're here to support you, um, have discussions with you if you're uh, struggling to ensure that you've met the basic academic requirements, um, if you're looking to upgrading, or if you want to do assessment testing, um, or if you want to talk about strategies, how you might be a more competitive applicant uh, to a particular program, such as the biomedical engineering program. So within the slide here that we can see talking about start dates, um, the biomedical engineering program does have its intake in September each year. So it'd be September 2021 uh, for this year is the next intake. And I'm just going to minimize something because it's covering the screen. Um, October 1st of 2020 is when we started taking applications for this program. And we would carry on with that up until mid-April as of April 15th of 2021 at which point the department will collect all the applications and review the group uh, competitively. Some of the qualities that this department is looking for, and oftentimes this is the case with a lot of programs, is effective communication and analytical skills. So as you're going through the program and you're working with your instructors and your classmates, um, it's important to have these aspects um, so that you can be successful within the program. Um, and especially as you work um, both independently as an individual, but also within a team setting. So BCT does have a lot of team focus um, within completion of assignments. And you'll find that you may be doing uh, group assignments as was mentioned by Alex, um, especially to make sure that you're getting a practical emphasis um, within the program and you're sharing your, 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 your experience uh, between your classmates and you uh, to accomplish those tasks. 
as well as important uh, for this industry, especially to be conscientious um, and hardworking. So it's it's not something that necessarily can be taught within a program. Um, you want to make sure that you have these aspects and that you can um, utilize them as you go through the program to accomplish your, your coursework, um, as well as within any practical setting um, and then upon graduation. Excellent physical mental health is also very important. Um, you want to make sure that with BCAT, the rigor involved with BCAT programming, um, that you are not overextended. So you don't want to have too much going on outside of the classroom setting so that you can maintain your studies and have that focus. Um, so making sure that you have support groups, uh, be it family or friends that are uh, assisting you um, as you go through that time. And, and time management and stress management skills are also very important. So the rigor of the, the studies at BCAT can be quite uh, significant. And so because of that, we want to make sure that you're on top of things, you're not missing assignments um, or deadlines that are assigned to you, um, and certainly that you're not getting overly stressed. Um, you want to have those outlets that are available to you to go and be active or take some time away from your studies to make sure that you're uh, balancing everything in your life. Strong decision making and problem solving skills are also very important. Um, this obviously is more of an analytical program and, and you want to make sure that you are determined as you go into um, those settings where you're involved with your classmates and the instructors. And then of course comfort with computers and literacy associated with that. Um, 3D visualization is quite important, manual dexterity and eye and hand coordination skills. Um, all that will be um, important aspects both within the program and as you complete and graduate from BCAT to get involved in industry. Let's go on to the next slide. Thank you, Julie. So with respect to entrance requirements, um, the academic requirements will be listed on the program page. Um, for this presentation, we've actually put them into the slide as well, but it's important to take a look at the full set of information on the program page. Um, there will be competitive preferences that are outlined by the department in addition to these basic academic requirements that do need to be proven by the application deadline. So there's a number of different ways that that can be done. Um, there's a link below the requirements that says um, read more about how to meet BCIT's program requirements and that will have more details about upgrading options, assessment testing, um, use of midterm grades and for those of you that might be involved in your high school uh, senior year you can also do a search for high school applicants which will have additional options available to you uh, for submission of grade 11 marks to prove your grade 12 uh, grade 12 subject matter as long as you have the minimum grade achieved and you can show that that grade 12 subject course is registered and it may be in your final quarter um, and so a midterm grade may not be accessible to you at that point but certainly, as you can see here, they are looking for those minimum academics um, uh, B level with a, the pre-calculus 12 and physics 12 or better, as well as uh, a B level in the chemistry 11 or a C plus level in chemistry 12. And then, of course, a C plus level or better in English 12 as well um, or equivalent. Um, they've obviously outlined that you can use three credits of post-secondary English, humanities or social sciences as well from a recognized institution. So there's a lot more detail again that you'll find on the website with additional links what if I don't meet these English requirements and so on so I would encourage you to take a look at the full set of details there and certainly reach out to us if you have any questions and we'll go on to the next slide and we'll talk eventually about contact options with program advising but first we want to cover the application process so within the online application process that you can find on the BCIT website we want to first encourage you as I mentioned before to review the entrance requirements in full um, and make sure that you're familiar with the application processing dates to make sure you don't miss the application deadline. Um, upgrade where necessary and then ensure that you've collected all the documents um, that you need, um, your transcripts and any additional documents um, so you can convert them into PDF file format to be able to upload as part of that online application process. That would also include the mandatory applicant questionnaire which you can find on the program page fill that out in full, save it as a PDF on your computer, and then be ready to upload it as part of the application process online. There is a link on the homepage um, that says apply to a full-time program or submit your application to a full-time program, but you can also go direct to bcit.ca forward slash apply. Once you've finished the application process online, um, the department will review the group of applicants. Um, they will competitively select um, the strongest candidates and shortlist them. Um, so that they can be uh, made contact with 
and then uh, through that contact, they'll they'll further uh, narrow down the group to the selected students to be accepted, and they'll make that final decision and be and inform those applicants um, in May. And so this process can take a number of weeks, so four to six weeks roughly um, after the application deadline date. We definitely appreciate your patience during that time, as the department needs to take that time to uh, to review all the aspects of each applicant. Let's go on to the next slide. Thank you, Julie. Um, so ladder opportunities we did already talk about, so we'll flash right past that. Um, thank you very much uh, to the department for that. Um, when we're talking about having you enroll in BCIT, there's a lot of different things that will be a part of containing your or maintaining balance uh, as a student here. Um, so this is a, an eight dimensions model of your well-being that the student services department is taking on. So it's looking at aspects like intellectual, occupational, physical, financial, psychological, environmental, spiritual, and social aspects. Um, you can actually learn more about um, each of these uh, initiatives through the website at bcit.ca forward slash student services. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the full information there. And we'll go on to the next slide to talk about the different uh, support departments uh, that BCIT has available. So for anyone that is of an Indigenous background, the Indigenous Initiatives Department, I think that um, department's title has changed from services to initiatives, um, would be there to support you uh, in your pursuit of BCIT, as well as if you're looking into funding to pay for the um, cost of the program, um, you can make contact with the Student Financial Aid and Awards Department. There's a lot of awards that um, don't necessarily get um, taken on each year. People don't necessarily apply to everything that's available, so I would encourage you to chat with them about what might be available uh, that could be specific to this program or specific to you as an individual applicant. Accessibility services is also available to provide um, services to those that have uh, designated uh, support needed. Um, so if you want to make contact with them, there might be the opportunity to complete an exam in a private room and have an extended uh, time frame uh, to do so. So that's just one example of a support that they would provide. As well, health being as important as it is, especially um, during the present uh, situation that we're facing with the pandemic, Student Health Services is located on campus. Um, they would be available to chat with um, if you're facing any situations, even if it's something simple, um, like you feel like you come down with a cold. Um, and currently you can connect with them by phone and I believe virtually as well. Counseling and Student Development is also located with Health Services. Um, they would be there to assist you if you need some, um, uh, some direction with respect to uh, uh, stress management or study habit skills, um, or if you just have other personal issues that are coming up uh, while you're attending BCIT. And then of course, maintaining that balance, uh, we wanna get you uh, to be active. You know, you don't be inside the books all the time or on a computer all the time. So getting out just to do something active and connecting with recreation services through their virtual uh, fitness programs uh, would be an, another important aspect to uh, pursue. Let's go on to talk about contact with program advising. Yes, there we go. So. Connecting with us in program advising, you can actually call us uh, during the week. So you can call the toll-free number uh, displayed on the screen here, 1-866-434-1610, or the standard phone would be 604-434-1610. Um, you can reach out to us in the mornings on Mondays and Fridays from 10 a.m. till noon, or in the afternoons on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from 1 till 3.30 p.m. You can also email your inquiry to us and we'll respond to that. Um, but within the email request, you could also um, inquire about a virtual appointment. So you can meet with us uh, virtually through Zoom one-on-one -on -one and discuss your questions that way. The email address is listed at the bottom here, program underscore advising at bcit.ca. I would also encourage you to take a look on our website just to make sure these services haven't changed. Um, sometimes over the summer we do adjust them. Um, so you can see that reference at bcit.ca forward slash advising. And we'll go on to the next slide and talk about social media and other ways to connect with PCIT. So there's a lot of great options to connect with us on social media or to find out what's what's going on on campus, um, be it current students or sometimes graduates are highlighted, um, and that could be through Facebook or possibly Instagram. Uh, YouTube has a lot of great videos from BCIT, um, either program specific or general, um, so I would encourage you to take a look at some of those. 
And then you might have an opportunity to also connect with either an instructor or a former student or even a present student through LinkedIn. There are some of these other areas such as um, student tours or visits to campus, spend a day that aren't presently available, unfortunately, during the pandemic. Um, we don't have a lot of presence on campus or not nearly as much as we normally would. Um, but where those are not available, we're, we're hosting a lot more information sessions such as this one in a virtual way. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to connect with us through that option. And I believe after that, we're gonna go on to talk about questions and answers. Um, feel free to post questions in the chat. I believe Julie might be um, verbally asking some of those questions um, to both ourselves in program advising um, and the department to respond to. Hi everyone, Janice has been responding to most of the questions um, and Anthony, so I don't see anything that um, hasn't been answered yet. If anyone wants to just unmute themselves and ask, um, please feel free to do so. Oh, okay. Um, will the next term for 2021 be taken online or on campus? Is it determined yet from Francis? Uh, no. So are they asking, sorry, can you say that again? Are they asking if the fall has been fully determined whether it's going to be entirely online? Correct. That has not been determined, but what you want to be doing is um, referring to the um, COVID information on our website and any updates on what will happen for the fall will be posted there. But as of today, there has not been um, any confirmation as to what the fall will look like. Excellent. Thanks, Janice. Right now um, we're doing a, a hybrid model. So all of our, uh, the hands-on labs are done at BCIT and then the rest is done online. I have a question for the BMET, um, for the biomedical engineering faculty uh, from Mira. I may have missed this, but are practicums and labs offered in BC only or are they available across Canada? Um, well, I'll actually answer that question online, but I'll repeat that. We have uh, practicum sites across Canada. Um, so Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta. Um, I don't think we have any student went to Quebec yet, but almost every province as we have practicum sites. We have a question from D. Tom K. You said 20% of your students come straight from high school and 80% have some post-secondary education. Is it because fewer high school students apply or is it because preference is given to people with some post-secondary education? Mm -hmm. um, now, we are one of the not that many programs uh, within the School of Health that still accept high school students straight from high school. Now, we have a scoring system uh, based on the marks of these Quite courses, but we also give uh, some some uh, some points to students who have post secondary education, like a degree or, or whatever. Um, so it just comes down to right um, uh, in recent years, it's about twenty percent students straight from high school, and 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 the rest have some post secondary education, but it really doesn't mean that these students are, are the best student if they have a degree or whatever. And actually quite often our, our top student in our graduating class are students that actually uh, only have high school education before they came into the program. It really depends on right, whether or not the student are fully dedicated, if they, are work, if they work hard, if they are really interested in, in biomedical engineering, that those students are the ones that are doing well, well in our program. Okay, and we're gonna have to end there. I didn't realize we were over time and we still have a quick video to show. So if everybody can just, um, you're gonna get the slide deck and you're gonna get the recording. So please feel free to email Anthony if you have any other questions. We're gonna watch a quick video before we end this session. 
here at BCIT, we have 32 programs in the School of Health Sciences. They range anywhere from specialty nursing, bachelor of nursing, diagnostics, lab, and allied health programs. We are very unique in that we have one of the largest simulation labs in Western Canada. So the learning model prior to the pivot to online learning, it was primarily learners coming on campus to get that foundational knowledge through lectures or group activities. And then they would still have their labs and the experiential learning aspect of it. What we're doing now is more of a blended approach so that uh, instructors can put their lectures online and uh, they can also put group activities online as well. They still need to come on campus to do some of those hands-on components, but we are seeing more of a blended approach. We've really worked hard to make sure that the students get the experience that they deserve, that it meets the learning outcomes and the competencies of the program. The only difference is that we've uh, spread things out a little bit further and sometimes their class sizes are a little bit smaller. But other than that, they're getting the same experiential learning opportunities as always. So we've heard uh, our students say their experience of coming on campus for these simulation labs, they have felt very safe. We've even had students say that they feel safer coming onto campus than they do going into their own local grocery store. And I think that's due to all the organization, the time that we spent over the summer with occupational health and safety. We've marked the hallways with arrows indicating the direction so that we can control the flow, marking the floors so that they know exactly where they need to stand, and the scheduling too so that we don't have all of the students on campus at the same time they go to the specific bedside that they have been instructed to do so, and then the instructor is ready to start the simulation. In some cases, we actually have them in the back of the room and using a technology called an ELMO, the instructor can be much further away and can actually do a demonstration for all students to see. They don't have to be right next to them. So if a student ever needs an instructor to step in closer to assist, then the instructor with the proper PPE steps in does that assistance and then steps away again. In many cases, faculty will be wearing PPE all day, and that's due to the frequent need to move close to the students to assist them in the lab. And then once the students have completed their simulation experience, then they immediately leave the campus and they can continue on their day. Some of the other unique methods that we've employed is that instead of the students actually coming on campus for a simulated experience, we've shipped some equipment to them. Now, it's just small pieces of equipment. They actually ran a home-based simulation using family members or people within their bubble, and then they ship that equipment back to us. We have a highly interactive web-based virtual simulation program that we use, and the learners can interact with 3D avatar patients. And this, we found that it really reduces the amount of time that they come on campus because they hit the ground running when they come to the simulation lab. The students really enjoyed some of these activities that were really just supposed to be a temporary fix. Um, they really want that to continue as part of the program. Uh, so we will continue to do that. We're all looking for creative solutions to continue the experiential learning opportunities that BCIT is known for. And so it's really exciting to see that not only in our programs in the School of Health Sciences, uh, we see that collaboration, but we're seeing this collaboration across the entire campus. So it's an amazing thing to see and experience. And with that, I have had a request to just put up the advising contact information um, for anyone that wants to take a snapshot or just note the program advising email is here and their phone number um, and the website. Just leave that up there for a second. And now I'd just like to take a minute to say thank you to Jennifer Elliott, um, Anthony Chan, Alex Sayer, Jesse Taylor, Janice Pontes um, for uh, being here for this production and giving and sharing all of this information. We hope that we'll hear from you all and expect an email from us with the recording and the slide deck on Friday afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.